Greetings, listeners of The Michael Shermer Show. It's your host, Michael Shermer. Today's episode is brought to you by Wondrium. You know, Wondrium, the college-level series of courses and documentaries and travel logs and how-to lessons and tutorials. For me, I listen mostly to the college courses brought to you by professional, uh, screened, and produced college professors in a studio. So the content uh, is super high quality. The recording, sound, and visuals are great. Um, And uh, it's just a great source of content consumption when you're out about doing other things. Here's one I have on my list to listen to. Again, I just scroll through the the app to see what comes up every day. They're constantly posting new stuff. Here's a 12 lecture series called Experiencing Shakespeare from Page to Stage be good for somebody like me because I love Shakespeare, but I don't know that much about it. I never took courses in Shakespeare or even in lit crit or anything like that in college. So I really don't know much about it. But um, so here's reading versus watching Shakespeare. Yeah. Okay. I've seen some of the Shakespeare movies, of course. Plays in the Elizabethan age. Secrets of Shakespeare's verse. Uh, That should be good. Discovering Shakespeare's characters. Shakespeare's Rhetoric and wordplay. I know there's a lot of it there. What are the soliloquies revealed? I have no idea. (laughs) So that'll be an eye-opener for me. How Shakespeare uses prose, Shakespeare's creative imagery. There's a lot of that in there. You know, when you read Shakespeare, uh, you have to uh, have one of those editions where they have endnotes that tell you what the words mean because so much of it is uh, so old now that um, the English uh, words have changed meaning. Designing and directing Shakespeare's plays and to the stage. Okay, well, all right. So check that out. If you want to subscribe to Wondrium through the show, you get 50% off, half off. Yeah, that's 50%. (laughs) On the first three months, the first quarter of your yearly subscription rate, which is the way to go because then you access all the great content right there on your phone or your iPad or your laptop. 50% off if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash s-h-e-r-m-e-r shermer you know that wondrium.com slash shermer check it out for your half off in the first three uh, months of your subscription all right thanks for listening my guest today is dr nicholas dirks he is the president and ceo of the new york academy of sciences one of the oldest and most respected scientific institutions in the country he's an internationally renowned historian and anthropologist and he leads the Academy in promoting science-based solutions to world challenges. There are a few of those, including pandemics and global warming. You may have heard of those, too. His work at the Academy facilitates the dissemination of scientific information, supports broad access to scientific education, studies counter-bias and Academy in the laboratory, and supports scientists across all stages of their careers. He was awarded his Ph.D. from the University of Chicago and has taught at UC Berkeley, Caltech, the University of Michigan, and Columbia University. Nicholas, thanks for coming on the show, and nice to see you. Good to see you, Michael. Glad to be here. So give us a little bit of background. Oh, I was going to mention that the last time I uh, was at the New York Academy of Sciences was in 2015 for a uh, seminar on like the evolution of morality. And um, Heather Berlin and I were teamed up against a couple of other people. One was a theist and... I forget the other person was a neuroscientist, I think. In any case, it was pretty interesting. I love being there. I'd never been to the National Academy of Sciences. What a wonderful building and facility you have there. So let's start there. What is it you do at the National Academy of Sciences? Yeah, no, it's the New York Academy, not the National. And uh, I mean, sorry, dif- no, sorry, the, yeah, New York. And the, yeah, yeah. and the difference, of course, is uh, that we are an independent agency, not funded by the government, not answerable to the government, but one, an, an institution that was founded back in, 20, I'm sorry, in 1817. So we're 205 years old. And, wow. uh, and we've been uh, through a lot of different phases and we've been in a lot of different places. And I hate to tell you this, but the wonderful place that you were in in 2015 is no longer part of our uh, architectural oh, no. signature. Yeah, we had <laughs> to move out during the pandemic. You know, we are an organization that, among other things, uh, presents conferences on subjects of a uh, wide variety of kinds, including, of course, the one on which you, uh, the one where you appeared. But, you know, the pandemic changed a few things. And uh, one of the things, of course, it did immediately for us as an academy 
was to close down all the actual in-person conferences that we had. Of course, that was happening to every organization around the world that uh, was doing in-person events of any kind. But we left that beautiful uh, uh, structure that was World Trade Center Building 7. We had actually been the first occupants of that building after it was, uh, after it was put up, of course, uh, uh, just next to Ground Zero uh, uh, after 9-11. Uh, but we are now in a somewhat more uh, uh, modest uh, building over a few blocks away on Broadway, right next to Zuccotti Park. So we still have a, a, a great place, but uh, we, we did have to adjust. But the Academy is, uh, is, is, a, you know, is an interesting organization because, of course, we, uh, we have 20,000 members. That includes young people, it includes retired scientists, scientists from industry, scientists from the university world, uh, and people interested in science. Uh, and we effectively can do anything that our membership, our board, our staff, uh, and uh, that includes me, uh, want to do. And uh, of course, the pandemic became a time when we were just uh, you know, very focused on trying to get out the best information uh, in a very timely way and, and, and talking to the top experts in the field as knowledge became available about the pandemic. And uh, that became, in some ways, uh, you know, one of the most important things that we've done over the last two years, which happens to be the two years that I've been at the New York Academy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, maybe let's start there. Because um, I guess I ask this question all the time, why vaccine hesitancy? Why the doubts about the CDC, Anthony Fauci, you know, the most evil man in America. And, you know, he lied and the CDC can't be trusted and so on. You know, decades ago, the scientific institutions were the, among the most uh, trusted scientists. Uh, professors, teachers were always high up there in, in trust. And that seems to have collapsed. What is your explanation for that? Well, you know, first of all, I, I, I will tell you that my own background uh, in terms of discipline is history and anthropology. Those are the two fields that I've taught in over the years. Uh, and uh, I've always, therefore, approached science from the point of view of a social scientist. And I've thought about the past history, of course, of science and technology, as well as the social, cultural, and even political implications of work in science. Uh, so I will begin uh, addressing your question in part by talking about the great pandemic of 1918, 1919, when, of course, uh, the so-called Spanish flu, even though it actually originated in Kansas, uh, occasioned some of the same debates and some of the same reactions that the uh, pandemic that we're still uh, in at least the tail end of uh, occasioned uh, uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, lots of places, lots of people uh, didn't want to wear masks, didn't want to abide by public health recommendations to keep social distance, to avoid indoor gatherings, particularly gatherings that were in crowded and uh, unventilated kinds of uh, buildings or facilities. Uh, and, you know, if you look even at the United States uh, during the Spanish flu pandemic, you see that some cities did much better than others, largely on the basis of whether or not local institutions, local government, uh, and uh, local public health uh, agencies were held in greater or less esteem by the people in those cities. So some cities did very well, St. Louis, some not so well, Philadelphia. Uh, and there was a huge variation. Of course, there weren't vaccines. And uh, vaccines, uh, although they have been around since the early 19th century, some of the first vaccines, of course, were the smallpox vaccine that was, in fact, originally developed in India in the 1840s, um, but which uh, you know, was something that had a miraculous effect on, uh, on our global health because smallpox virtually disappeared after the use of the vaccine. Has then been followed by having vaccine after vaccine after vaccine, which has been almost miraculous in terms of uh, affording us with the uh, possibility of health in the face of all kinds of viral threats. Uh, polio, of course, in some ways is the most contemporary example of a disease that was uh, certainly there when I was, uh, when I was born. And, uh, and I do remember, even when I was very, very little, my mother wondering if she should take us to the swimming pool uh, during the summer in 
times when there were some outbreaks of polio. But I was also uh, very early on vaccinated with polio. It was something that everybody in the school lined up to take with great anticipation. Uh, but you know, in the rollout of the polio vaccine, one of the batches was contaminated. And the result was that quite a number of people came down with polio because of the vaccine, even as many, many others were, of course, being given a free pass and afforded protection for life from that dreaded disease. But it tapped into a public concern about medicine, about, uh, about, about uh, how uh, uh, something like a vaccine works on the system, whether a vaccine, in fact, uh, isn't some nefarious effort to put some drugs or chemicals in your body that are going to make one, uh, you know, wasn't in those days, we weren't thinking about chips and Bill Gates, but there were, there were people who were concerned. And so vaccine hesitancy in the modern sense does actually go back to the 50s and that bad experience of that one batch of uh, a polio vaccine. But again, you know, vaccine after vaccine for measles, mumps, rubella, you know, all the things that, uh, that we uh, may or may not remember from our childhoods. But if we have children, we certainly remember the screaming of our, uh, of our, of our kids when they got their childhood vaccines. And, um, and we, we know that they, or many of us know anyway, that those vaccines have, have really changed uh, our lives and, uh, and, and, and made health a much more uh, uh, accessible and, and uh, in the face of these kinds of terrible diseases, a much more uh, available um, uh, uh, life option. So what is it about vaccines then that has occasioned this level of hesitancy? Again, as you know, Michael, uh, there were anti-vaxxers before the COVID pandemic. And uh, there were, of course, many people who uh, believed on the basis of an erroneous article that was published back in uh, The Lancet uh, almost 20 years ago that, uh, that vaccines for MMNR were associated with autism. And of course, there's been a rise in autism, whether it's just its diagnosis or whether it's, it, its actual incidence is hard to tell. But there's been a rise in autism, a great deal of concern about autism. And, uh, and an easy, uh, easy target for that anxiety uh, became available at the point that, you know, a scientist or somebody who looked like he was a reputable scientist came out and made that, made that announcement and that correlation. So, you know, it took off. And it took off in part because a vaccine goes into the system. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, not fully understood how, how vaccines work. People believe because they at least understand something about how vaccines work that you're actually getting a dose of the disease. But what does it mean to have an inactive virus as opposed to an active virus? Uh, and so you already have that kind of backdrop. Then, of course, uh, uh, a lot of studies were done subsequently to show, for example, that autism was not at all connected to, uh, uh, to childhood uh, vaccination for measles. But um, that didn't stop a lot of people from being concerned. But there you are. You get to 2019, 2020. The uh, pandemic takes hold first in China and then, of course, uh, here and around the world. Uh, and, um, uh, and you have, uh, again, massive global fear about this disease. People dying, people getting very, very sick. Uh, you know, this little microbe wreaking havoc, changing our lives. Uh, and uh, the almost miraculous development and then rollout of the mRNA vaccines by both Pfizer and Moderna, uh, you know, were seen by many of us as a testimony to the miraculous, almost miraculous capacity of science in our, in our modern age to produce a cure, or at least a prophylactic that is going to prevent us from serious disease and hospitalization and so on and so forth. But it's going to work not even through the inactive uh, uh, virus, but rather through a kind of trick, a kind of manipulation of our RNA to simulate the virus, uh, stimulate, therefore, the immune uh, response of the, of the cells and uh, of, our, of, our, uh, of, our, of our bodies. And um, that additional uh, uh, development and those uh, elements of the story 
fell into this kind of almost um, uh, ready-made trap that became exploited by uh, a whole variety of political interests. And uh, we all lived through it. And we know how deeply vexing it has been to try to persuade people that the vaccine is safe, that it, by any statistical measure, it's safer than getting in a car and driving, in fact, to the hospital or clinic or pharmacy where you're going to get your <laughs> vaccine. And that it has had just, you know, unbelievably uh, direct uh, 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 effects on our health with respect to COVID-19. Yeah, I was born in 54, so I'm, my parents later told me they were relieved that the polio vaccine, you know, Jonas Salk was a hero. I mean, this was, you know, a massive uh, thing. I do wonder um, if like uh, vaccine hesitancy is in part tapping into the disgust emotion that humans have. Uh, I mean, bodily effluvia, feces, vomit, you know, the idea that I'm going to put this contagion into my body feels differently than say, I mean, there's no antibiotic hesitancy, right? Nobody thinks, Oh, antibiotics, you know, this is terrible very risky, you know, Bill Gates might be doing something with that antibiotic, you know, nothing like that. It's just people yeah. just take antibiotics, like, well, of course. But vaccines, see, they, it does feel different. Like if I said, well, we're going to put a, just a tiny, tiny bit of feces in, in your blood, and this is going to protect you from whatever, people would just be totally disgusted. I mean, any amount just feels like completely wrong, <laughs> right? So maybe there's some kind of tapping into human psych evolved psychology related to the disgust emotion might might be part of it. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, 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 question because, of course, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we don't see antibiotic hesitancy, certainly not in the same way. And as much as there's anything like that, it would be perhaps not only an understandable but even a scientifically based hesitance to take. Uh, too many antibiotics because they can uh, actually desensitize your system to, uh, uh, to, to routine bacterial infection. And it can, of course, produce mutations in bacteria that will then escape the effectiveness of the, of the antibiotics that exist. So you could actually say that you know, antibiotic resistance would probably, at least a little bit of it, would be a good thing. Uh, here you have a vaccine that is uh, uh, nothing like an antibiotic in, for, in, in terms of its effect on the system. It's uh, much more benign. Uh, it is, uh, even in the case of the mRNA, it's not actually even the real virus. It's just a, it's a, it's a bit of information uh, that simulates the virus, uh, you know, through this extraordinary new technology around how you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, use RNA for all kinds of things that we never uh, understood 20 plus years ago. Uh, and yet, as you say, it feeds into uh, this fear of uh, some foreign substance, uh, you know, whether, uh, whether a disgusting substance or just an unknown, uh, exogenous, and therefore frightening uh, chemical uh, that will come into your system and work in some way that you just don't understand and, uh, and therefore develop, if not disgust, certainly fear. About And, you know, I've talked to people who uh, would hear the arguments, hear the statistics, and they would say, I'm just frightened of taking it. But of course, you know, uh, beyond that, uh, you, you've, you've had a, a political movement now that is, uh, that is developed really uh, in, in particular since the 1990s. Although, again, you could see in some ways its roots back in the uh, reactions to the polio vaccine, vaccine when uh, the you know, the assurances of, 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 of scientists and, and, and pharma companies and, and Jonas Salk, uh, notwithstanding, uh, mistakes were made. Uh, but it clearly has been a movement that has picked up on all kinds of other things. And we know, of course, that the anti-vax movement uh, has been associated with um, not just fear of science, but sometimes efforts on the part of some to market a whole variety of alternative kinds of medical, uh, uh, you know, uh, remedies of one sort or another, including a lot of nutritional supplements, many of them not tested or certainly approved by the FDA, uh, as well as, you know, the latest cure for cancer or the latest cure for 
uh, any number of other other things that we're of course uh, still searching for uh, effective cures across uh, the biomedical domain. So uh, you get that, but then you get also the total politicization of public health. Again, antecedents for this. I gave some examples in the early 20th century with the Spanish flu pandemic, but really nothing that would have fully prepared us for the level to which everything from the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine or uh, you know, a number, any a number of other- Ivermectin. Ivermectin uh, uh, on the one side, as opposed to uh, you know, taking the vaccine, following public health guidelines, uh, and, um, and, and, and trying the, uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, therapies that were being developed. Or, for example, the monoclonal antibodies that were made by Merck and Regeneron. So it's almost as if you, know, you have all these different things that begin to uh, accumulate, uh, uh, develop synergies with each other, and then, of course, uh, map on increasingly to a larger distrust of expertise, of science, of institutions, of uh, universities, the world I came from, and even in, uh, uh, wonderful institutions like the New York Academy of Sciences that has no tie to government, no ties to industry, no ties to any of the industries, any of the institutions that have uh, seemed, seemed to have occasioned so much skepticism, if not uh, if not outright rejection uh, across uh, certain large swaths of, uh, of the American public. Yeah, how do you explain the variation in responses to the virus uh, between people that are vaccinated and not? Because uh, I'll just use anecdotes because that's what drives so much of the conversation, but I have yeah. friends that didn't get vaccinated. They got COVID, you know, barely a cold, the equivalent of a light cold. I have a friend, one of my cycling buddies, Fittest guy I know, one of the strongest people in the country, and fifty plus bike racers. He's so tough. I call him, his ma- name is Mike. I call him Mighty Mike. He is so tough, <laughs> and he's vaccinated. He got it and just knocked him on his ass. Seven weeks off the bike, he barely functioned. Threw his leg over the bike to go for a little ride. Fell over. You know, just hopeless. And, and how can it that be? Why is there so much variation? Well. Uh, you know, huge variation in terms of the effects of this disease. Clearly, uh, uh, scientists are still trying to understand it. I mean, even today, there were new studies that came out about long COVID trying to explain why it is that some people have, uh, uh, have long COVID and uh, where it might be lodged in the body and how it has uh, uh, had different kinds of effects and whether it's related to, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, previously misunderstood uh, 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 diseases or syndromes, some of which are better understood than others, and some of which are still uh, mysteries to medical science. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it's been one of these cases where everyone has been watching science in real time, and not only watching it. I mean, everybody has been riveted to the story of COVID because it has totally upended our lives. I mean, you know, the same thing, of course, happened in, uh, in advance of this, in the HIV epidemic. But because it was uh, a disease that was initially, anyway, uh, 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 pretty much uh, localized in the, in the gay community, a lot of people who were uh, not engaged in, uh, in homosexual activity of any kind simply thought, okay, it's not going to affect me. It's not going to change my life. It didn't change their lives. It obviously changed a lot of people's lives, and it turned out to be a disease that affected uh, um, uh, heterosexual men and women and, uh, and others because of the modes of its transmission and the like. But, uh, but, but, you know, this one affected everyone. And so we were all watching. I was in California uh, when, uh, in March of 2020. We all remember where we were you know, and whether it was the 10th of March or the 11th or the 17th when, uh, you know, St. Pat's Day, when, uh, when, when a lot of states began their lockdown. And, uh, and I stayed there. But, you know, even from California, I watched uh, Cuomo's press conference uh, out of Albany because I got information there. Or I watched every time uh, Tony Fauci, who you obviously mentioned as a, as a major figure in this whole, in this whole part of our lives, uh, every time he would give a press conference uh, to find out what's the latest. 
And we all heard uh, you know, how science works in zigs and zags. We saw, you know, up close and personal because it was of such vital importance for all of us that science really didn't understand at the beginning what was going on. I'm sure you, like everybody in my household and everybody else I know for a long time, uh, wondered whether or not they could take mail and open it up without washing their hands or whether they should scrub the grocery bags that came in from the store. And if you got toilet paper, scrub it three times and then, you know, make sure you kept it somewhere uh, uh, secure so nobody else would take it. But, uh, you know, that's when we all thought that it was being spread by fomites from, you know, from, uh, from surfaces. Only, of course, to find at some point that it was aerosol-based uh, and therefore spread not through touch, but through, uh, through the air. Uh, so it was, uh, 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 for those of us who are connected in some way or another to the world of science, uh, incredible to see how quickly in some ways scientists and then, you know, pharmacologists, drug developers and others began to understand first the disease and second, how perhaps to uh, protect against it uh, and or treat it. Uh, but for many people for whom science is still a kind of black box, uh, it just displayed what seemed like massive ignorance misinformation from the point of view of many people who, uh, uh, of course, were having that reinforced by media they were uh, watching or seeing on social media. And, um, and of course, uh, they saw it change. And they saw it change over time in ways that did not inspire faith, trust, and, uh, and general um, uh, acceptance of, uh, of, of, of what was being said most recently. And of course, then it got you know, fed into the politics of the moment with the Trump administration, which on the one hand uh, funded Operation Warp Speed that played a very important role in the, uh, in the development of vaccines. But on the other hand, uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, was uh, involved in, uh, you know, a very difficult relationship with science and scientists. And uh, we all remember the look on Tony Fauci's face when the president made some comments about using bleach to deal with the pandemic. But this, again, was something that everybody saw, everybody read differently, uh, and that became a kind of, uh, a kind of public uh, uh, soap opera, the consequences of which, however, could be deadly uh, for each of us. And then, of course, to your particular question, Everybody had different experiences, both themselves and uh, through the experiences of the people they knew, uh, their friends, their family, uh, you know, and we all heard stories like the ones you just told. Some people who were as fit as could be, who had a terrible time, some of whom died. Others of whom, you know, might have fit even the demographics that were most vulnerable, people uh, of my age and above and uh, <clears throat> people who were immunocompromised and other otherwise particularly susceptible in some ways, at least in a, in a, with, you know, with uh, the demographic profiles that were being constructed for us, uh, uh, only to see that they were okay and it was just a cold or just uh, maybe a bad case of the flu, but nothing more than that. And of course, uh, uh, oh, really? yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a terrible time in some ways, uh, but it's also been a kind of window Onto, uh, onto science, I think, of a kind that we haven't really experienced for years. Yeah, so we really need to think of it as an on average. Um, and of course, individual anecdotes don't tell us much of anything, but on average, it's better to be vaccinated than not. It's better to be lean than overweight, better not to have diabetes than to have it. And you just add them all up and you're gonna get this kind of statistical trend and so the anecdotes then don't mean much. That seems to make the case. Also with the autism vaccine thing, again, anecdotal thinking is part of our evolved cognition. You know, if this happened, then that happened, X, then Y, A, and B, I, I therefore infer causality. You know, what's the last thing I did before my kid was diagnosed with autism? Oh yeah, we got that vaccine. Oh, I, that could be it. And you have Andrew Wakefield publishes this article in Lancet since withdrawn since shown to be fraudulent, since he was shown to be a fraud, taking money from these companies to find that connection and on and on. And, and by the way, I just riff, 
uh, on this from a skeptical perspective. This is called moving the goalposts. You know, the vaccines, it's the thimerosal in the vaccines that's causing the autism. Well, then that was taken out and that, and kids were still getting autism. Okay, okay, it's not the thimerosal, it's this other thing. Okay, then that was changed. Okay, no, no, it's not that. It's the sequence or it's the number or it's the the time between the vaccine. You know. And so moving the goalpost means that you've already drawn the conclusion. That's the conclusion. That's it. That's what we believe. And whatever you counter with, we're going to you know do some hand-waving around there. So that's the problem with that. Uh, I do think that uh, autism... I, I think the most of the increases from the broadened diagnostic criteria uh, of the spectrum, you know, it's and it's become more acceptable to accept that diagnosis, particularly if you're not extreme autism, you're on the spectrum, you just have cognitive diversity, you know, Elon Musk, I'm on the spectrum. Okay, well, you're very different from the this kid I know who has autism and can't even speak, right? So, uh, or Temple Grandin or whoever. And, uh, you know, so the category has gotten larger in that connection there. Okay, so two years ago, I was at Freedom Fest. I go to, every summer I go to Freedom Fest. It's this conference in Vegas, uh, mostly kind of libertarian uh, thinkers. So they're all over the map on this sort of thing. They don't trust big government. Um, they do like big corporations because they like capitalism. But, yeah. but th- so there was this one talk on um, vaccines and Fauci and so on. And anyway, this guy started the story with, you know, back in the 80s, when, late 80s with the AIDS uh, coming online, and there was a paper published, like in JAMA, one of the big journals, um, showing that um, AIDS, what was it? AIDS could be spread through water, right? So you should be careful by being in a swimming pool with somebody who has AIDS or with a gay person or something like this. And then... They later published, a couple months later, a paper showing that it could not be transmitted through the water. And guess who the author of these papers were? It was none other than Anthony Fauci. (laughs) The whole audience goes, oh, that guy, you know, he's just a flip-flopper, changes his mind. It's like, well, but that's how science actually works. You publish what you know at the moment, you get new evidence, and you publish something new saying, well, we were wrong. (laughs) And so I guess Anthony Fauci has kind of become the face of this, what to outsiders looks like flip-flopping. Like, you guys just can't get your story straight. What what should we do? And, uh, you know, the answer is, well, we just do what we can based on what we know at the moment. Uh, but then you have that contrasting story where he said, you know, don't wear face masks, you don't need face masks. Was he lying? Was it to protect the frontline workers that needed him and there was a supply chain problem? Was it miscommunication? You know, why is Fauci, just kind of give us specifics on that, but why is Fauci such a target of this? No, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, uh, just as, a, again, another historical note, I should say that, uh, uh, that Dr. Fauci gave uh, one of his uh, early lectures about HIV and the research that, uh, that he uh, both was doing himself and that were, was being done uh, uh, by his unit in the NIH at the New York Academy of Sciences back in the 80s. And we, we had some of the first scientific conferences on HIV at the time. Um, but, you know, uh, you've, you've, you've hit on that one moment uh, when I think uh, even people who are, uh, uh, you know, persuaded that, that, that Tony Fauci is a wonderful, wonderful doctor, has been a great leader, uh, and has been a great communicator, uh, begin to wonder, you know, is, was he indeed uh, uh, just saying, don't, don't think about masks because the people who really needed the, 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 the few masks that were available at the time uh, were frontline workers in, uh, in particular uh, in healthcare. Um, you know, I don't know what was in his head. I don't know exactly what was known at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, and when uh, it might be said that transition from thinking that it was spread on surfaces to spread by aerosol uh, was uh, was known. I think the uh, the truth of the matter, though, is that the really big uh, discovery early on in COVID days had to do with the fact that it was spread by asymptomatic carriers, and uh, and 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 that. I think is what confounded so many because again, New York Academy had one of the first conferences on SARS, uh, and I have to confess that uh, that when uh, I first heard about uh, COVID outbreaks in Wuhan, and I'd actually been in Wuhan 
uh, in uh, October of 2019. So uh, I was uh, tracking mm. this news. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, somewhat more closely, perhaps, than some others in the U.S. Uh, I, um, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was thinking that, you know, the SARS experience uh, is a very comforting one because uh, doctors were able to basically isolate the cases. It was, of course, very deadly as a virus. It had a much higher rate of, of, of mortality associated with it. But it 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 was it was controlled, and uh, again, I uh, uh, I was going to travel to Hong Kong during SARS, and I, I didn't have to. But my uh, my last job before the academy was being chancellor of UC Berkeley, and my predecessor, the former chancellor before me, actually had to go uh, for a donor relationship to Hong Kong during uh, the SARS outbreak. So it was something he told me these uh, um, amazing stories about. Uh, but, you know, the truth is that it was only spread by people with symptoms. And it was much easier to isolate as a result of that and ultimately to control. So, you know, when we began to learn that the spread, whether on surfaces or uh, through aerosol, was from, in many cases, asymptomatic carriers, either before they had the symptoms or, in some cases, uh, carriers, uh, you know, patients who never had the symptoms at all. Uh, uh, and we know about one in 10 uh, uh, people of, on average simply don't get sick uh, uh, from COVID-19. Um, uh, then, you know, it was, uh, it was a different kind of game. And then all of a sudden, you know, the question of uh, wearing masks routinely as opposed to, uh, you know, what you now still see in East Asia, uh, well, you still saw in, in East Asia, before this pandemic, but after SARS, which was, you know, when people have colds, they wear, they wear masks, just as a matter of courtesy. But, um, but that fed into all of this as well, and it became a complicating factor. And again, it became something both that was confounding for many people in the general public, uh, but it was also confounding for people in public health. How do, you, how do you deal with this? And there was a shortage in supply of, uh, of, of certainly N95 masks, uh, even a basic surgical mask. I mean, you know, like everybody else, you know, in our household, we tried to order all kinds of uh, N95 masks and Amazon. We didn't, you know, we just thought, okay, whatever it costs, we'll, we'll, we'll order these. And, you know, um, many times we would then get a message from Amazon a week later or two weeks later, sorry, they're not available. Or uh, we would get, there's been a delay and the delay would be of three months. Uh, and in fact, of course, uh, you know, by the time uh, we began to get some of those shipments of masks, they were much more readily available across uh, across the country. Um, again, you know, these are, uh, uh, are are things that people are learning about at the time. We certainly know, in retrospect, we had an undersupply of surgical masks and undercapacity in terms of ramping up production of surgical masks as quickly as we needed. There are all kinds of stockpiles that had been neglected. And, um, and I hope uh, that we've learned from the experience of the pandemic that we have to be much better prepared because it's going to happen again. Uh, and we know it's probably going to happen sooner than the 100 year uh, uh, um, you know, uh, period between the, uh, the Spanish flu outbreak and COVID 19. Yeah, I think we. Definitely dodged a bullet there. It's good to remember that the the death rate of AIDS was 100% until the drug cocktail came online, right? And SARS was, I don't know what it was, but way more than... What, what, are, what is the death rate now of, of uh, COVID-19? Where are we at this point? Well, you know, I don't know what it is. Uh, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me as far as what the death rate is with or without vac vaccination. But I think, you know, it was, it was closer to 3 4 percent for a while before the vaccine and it's uh, right. you know the basic right. flu is uh, you know about about one to two it's about half to a third of that i think mm. Mm. yeah where are you in the lab leak hypothesis versus the zoonomic hypothesis i had matt ridley and aline chan on the show and they had that new book called viral maybe eight months ago i think now um in which it seemed to me after reading the book it was kind of 50 50 and we just don't know what is your thought on that, and where are we now on that? Origins of SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, you know, uh, I keep hearing different people uh, who have 
develop very strongly held views on 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 this, you know, from my former colleague at Columbia, Jeff Sachs, to to others. I mean, my 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 predisposition, and I, I'm going to call it a predisposition because I haven't studied this in any way that would allow me to have anything other than a kind of, you know, general opinion. But uh, I I I don't think that it was a lab leak. I I think it came from. Uh, the pangolin and, and bats. I think it uh, it's much more likely because we've seen that happen before, and because uh, that chain of transmission is 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 something that uh, we know is 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 routine and uh, indeed happens all the time, uh, and makes sense in uh, in relationship to what we know about um, you know wild animal uh, uh, sales and uh, uh, and the like in places like the Wuhan market where. The outbreak uh, was clearly um, identified as 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 first as first taking place. So I think it's much more likely, more, much more than fifty percent, that it's uh, <clears throat> it's 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 from that method and not not leaking out of a lab. But you know, again, uh, you know, as a scientist, in my case, I'm a social scientist, but I still use the scientist there. Uh, I'd have to see the evidence. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. So I'm not persuaded yet, but I have to be open to uh, to a demonstration, uh, one way or the other. Now, of course, y you would answer, uh, uh, or you could respond by saying, "Well, you're not going to see the evidence because uh, you know the lab isn't opened up. <laughs> Chinese because are China hiding is it. not interested in it, and <laughs> yeah, uh, right. you know the pro point is just because they're hiding it doesn't mean it's there. You know, it's like uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily tell you one thing or another. There may be lots of other reasons why uh, the Chinese government doesn't want to have, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, uh, you know, health personnel uh, traipsing through a, a facility that has been under such uh, you know political attack from from some quarters. And you know, that would be reasonable too. So, Michael, I'm sorry to say, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But sociologically, it's interesting because the lab leak hypothesis was discussed initially, and then it became kind of a taboo, crazy conspiracy yeah. theory. And then John Stewart goes on that whatever late night talk show that was and says, of course it was. Look, it's right there in the name, Virology, Institute of Virology. This is what they do there. Oh, yeah. Then it became okay to talk about again. And it's just weird that so kind of culturally or sociologically, we go through those waves. Yeah, look, I uh, I think that um, you know the kind of litmus test for uh, you know for where one is on the political spectrum with respect to some of these kinds of judgments is uh, is one that you know of course is happening all across our uh, our political and and uh, and cultural discourse uh, and uh, yeah you know I uh, I've been an advocate for a long time both both of uh, of free speech uh, and uh, and 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 all that that means. Uh, but also of, uh, of of engaged, serious, uh, respectful, but vigorous debate about anything. Uh, you know, I was uh, not only a professor for many years, I was also a university administrator. I was chancellor of Berkeley when there were great controversies about speakers being invited to campus, speakers like Miley Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter. And oh my God, ben you were Shapiro. there for that. Wow. Well, I was. I was on my right. watch that the uh, great riot took place. Oh my in, God. Uh, Sproul Plaza. Uh, and, you know, I, I was on record for saying, you know, we have to be able to have debates with people who we not only may disagree with, but we may violently disagree with them, or we may find them uh, to be offensive, and we may find them to be, um, you know, really beyond the pale. But it's a university. That's what we do. We debate different points of view. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, we evaluate on the basis of uh, how Good an argument is how well it's made, what the factual basis is for it, and how uh, and how you uh, you know stack it up against the other arguments that are available. So, uh, so from that point of view, I have to say I'm discouraged that so many of the hot button issues in our uh, in our scientific world, but also in our general uh, political and cultural world, seem to be coded so that if you have a particular political point of view, you're going to have you know, a, a stock response to a question of the sort that you just asked me. Yeah, that brings up um, a point Steve Pinker makes in his new book, Rationality, about the distrust of science because it's involved in academia, 
And to outsiders, the Academy seems to have lost its mind over its censoriousness. I mean, the Academy used to defend free speech. UC Berkeley was the, you know, the, the founding, founding place of the free speech movement. And now they're canceling people and they're rioting when, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos, really? I mean, you're going to draw the line in the sand over this guy and protest and, you know, break Starbucks windows and, you know, all this crazy stuff to outsiders. And if you only watch Fox News and you saw, you know, like Tucker Carlson's weekly campus craziness segments that he had, it just seems like the Academy has just lost its mind. So Steve makes the point to an outsider, you know, why would I trust you guys on, on climate global warming, climate science vaccines, when you're engaged in these idiotic, crazy cultural wars over gender and race and I don't know what, you know, it's just, uh, you kind of lost your mind. So I don't trust any of you. So one thing that I will say in response to that, and uh, uh, forgive me, it's a little story, but um, so the night that Miley Yiannopoulos came to town, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was quite a, uh, quite an evening, uh, you know, we committed uh, a, a, a vast amount of, uh, you know, our uh, University of California police uh, force to uh, protecting the peace and to ensuring that the event would take place, only to find that there was a group of people who were dressed uh, in black with face coverings, again, well before the pandemic, who came and, uh, and very strategically, very uh, effectively closed down the event. Uh, they came in, they dispersed across the crowd, they broke through the barriers. Uh, they used, in fact, the barriers to break open uh, the doors and windows of, uh, of the student center where the event was uh, to be held and where Milo was in the basement uh, and led to, uh, to the police on the spot, on the ground, uh, calling the event off, getting Milo out of the building to make sure that he would be safe and trying to disperse the entire crowd. So, you know, I was... I wasn't there. I was in my office, but we were monitoring this whole situation, and it was uh, clear it had just gone way out of control, right? But uh, later in the evening, after after the uh, this group of whether they're Antifa or whoever, but you know they were clearly uh, an outside group. After they went and smashed all the ATMs in Berkeley and smashed the windows of the Starbucks at the corner of uh, uh, of Oxford and um, uh, just where the campus begins uh, on the on the west side, um, you know, they were about, they they said let's go to the chancellor's house, right? Which is where I, by that time in the evening was, uh, but they didn't know where it was. They couldn't find it. <clears throat> I was about to be evacuated. My wife was away. I had two my two dogs and me, and that was it. My kids were away. And the police had the car out in the back, and they were ready to take me and the two dogs and move us to safety. And it turned out that the crowd couldn't find the house. So we knew immediately, because every Berkeley student knew exactly where the chancellor's house was. It's the only house on campus. Uh, we knew it was outsiders. So I just want to you know, hasten to say that uh, you know, some of the most uh, uh, you know, dramatic stuff, and we were on, you know, on Fox News uh, fairly regularly uh, those few days. Of course, we woke up the next morning to the first tweet that President Trump made about university campuses threatening to cut all federal aid to Berkeley. So I, I did manage to you know, uh, establish a first with uh, respect to my relationship with the president. But, um, but, we, we, you know, so, but we also know that you know, there were a lot of students who felt, uh, uh, who felt threatened by Milo, who didn't want him to come, who were concerned that he might call out individuals and uh, identify them as trans or whatever, and that there were all kinds of things that were, uh, you know, of real concern. We also know that, uh, that the current uh, concerns about uh, uh, words that could be uh, offensive uh, has been taken by some to, uh, to, to challenge the very basic principles of free speech that, as you say, Berkeley, you know, uh, 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 was, has been is still indelibly associated with because of the free speech movement of 1964. Um, and so, uh, so sure, you know, there are, uh, there are politics around speakers and around speech on university campuses that, you know, are, uh, uh, are, are not shining examples of a commitment to free speech. Uh, but uh, I give the example of the, you know, this crowd that really was from the outside just to say that, you know, 
largely the, uh, the academics who are on university campuses who are doing the work on CRISPR-Cas9 or on uh, you know, mRNA uh, or on climate change or on the future of technology. And some of the leading people in all of those fields, among many, many others, of course, work at Berkeley, uh, are not actually part of any of those debates. You know, they, uh, they take for granted that, you know, in the world of science, you have free speech. It's better if your speech is based on evidence and experiment and that it's as transparent as possible. So you show the evidence, you have your work peer reviewed by other experts in the, I mean, you know, life goes on in the world of research. And, and that, that world is, is a world that continues to be incredibly rigorous and, you know, there are reasons that many of the debates that take place that are so, to me anyway, interesting on university campuses because people are arguing about things where they have different points of view and they have different, you know, facts that they, that they bring out and, you know, they struggle to adjudicate what uh, and how, uh, uh, you know, a particular finding might be interpreted or a particular point of view might be substantiated. Um, you know, it still is a very rigorous place for, uh, uh, for intellectual discovery and intellectual debate. So it's easy to get distracted by the fact that there is uh, you know, a group of students who are you know, agitating about this or uh, you know, concerns about uh, legitimate, but nevertheless, you know, somewhat tangential uh, 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 debates among predominantly student, students and, and the student body. And forget that you know the real research work of the university goes on. But you're you're right to ask the question the way you did because, and again, this goes back to what we were saying about the pandemic and about vaccines, because these things get associated in the public mind. So if you see the university as a place that can't stand to hear, you know, difficult but you know real truths about certain things, or at least how people some people view those things, then how can you trust them? on anything else. And that is uh, indeed one of the biggest, I think, um, challenges that we face, uh, both at the level of uh, representing the role of the university, the importance of the university in, in our life, and the fact that it is so tied up with our, uh, our success as a nation, our success as an economy. Much of the innovation that of course might get designed and packaged and brought to market in places like the Silicon Valley or in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, nevertheless comes out of the fundamental research that is done in, in universities or funded by the government. Uh, and uh, it's easy to lose sight of that. So it's, uh, uh, it's a problem in universities, but it's a problem as well for science much more broadly. And uh, one of the things we're thinking a lot about at the New York Academy of Sciences is basically how to, how to how to try to restore a more general trust uh, in scientific method uh, and scientific expertise. It's a struggle right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just as a sidebar on that regarding Milo, you know, I followed him pretty carefully while he was on his, his tour. And, uh, you know, people were losing their minds on Twitter about this. And I, I kept tweeting, you know what public speakers really hate more than protests? Empty auditoriums and no one comes to hear them speak. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I've, I've done a lot of public talks at universities and it's just so disheartening when the audience is small. You know, it, w what people like Milo want is they want screaming mobs, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a free speech fundamentalist. It sounds like you are too, but... You know, you, you don't have to, you can't invite everybody. Uh, and in fact, maybe a university brings in a dozen speakers a year at most, maybe. And you, who are you going to invite? I wouldn't invite Milo, even though I'm, he should be free to say whatever he wants. I don't have to enable him. I don't have to bring him to my university. You know, maybe I bring in Charles Murray, who's a conservative or a libertarian, whatever Charles is. And, you know, he has these controversial views that were written in the bell curve. And he's had several books since then, but he's a serious scholar. And, uh, you know, maybe have somebody debate him who knows genetics and intelligence testing and all that as well as he does. And that seems legitimate. So, you know, as a former university professor, now you're hosting events at New York Academy. How do you decide who, who we're going to give a voice to? Who's legitimate on the other side? You know, like vaccine skeptics or climate skeptics. Who would, who would count, uh, you know, not some activist that's going to 
ignite Antifa to show up, but, you know, somebody who's serious on the other side? Well, you know, it's a great question. And, uh, and just to begin with, uh, you know, your comment about Milo and the university and Charles Murray is a, a alternative, uh, example of, uh, someone who is conservative and controversial, but nevertheless, uh, 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 a fellow traveler of all the other scholars and, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, uh, serious, uh, uh people in, in the university. I totally agree. And, uh, and I think, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, and you know this from following Milo, that he was, he was invited very specifically to provoke that kind of reaction. Uh, and it was intentional on the part of the group. It was the Berkeley Republicans uh, uh, who, uh, Berkeley students uh, who were Republicans who, who, who invited him. And they didn't really care about hearing him. I mean, they thought it would be a show and they would enjoy it and so on. It was entertainment for them, perhaps. But it wasn't meant as a serious uh, scholarly intellectual uh, 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 debate. It was meant to get the ire of the liberals. And it was meant to show the hypocrisy of, uh, of, of, of the majority groups at, at Berkeley who uh, would carry on about the importance of having controversial speakers, but then uh, obviously drew the line when it came to somebody like Milo. And, you know, uh, uh, the, the left played right into the, or at least many on the left, played right into their hands and produced exactly the kind of event that, as you say, uh, Milo wanted. I mean, he probably didn't want to be, you know, uh, shuttled out from the basement in a police car, uh, but he made, he made a lot of hay out of it that night, even at, uh, in his hotel room, broadcasting how he'd been shut down at Berkeley. Um, the, 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 but the, you know, the more serious question in a way is uh, what you went on to, and that is, how do you, uh, how do you think about, you know, um, covering different perspectives, different positions, different ways of thinking about fundamental questions in science? Uh, and, um, and how do you make decisions about, you know, who's going to get the microphone and who isn't? Uh, you might advocate for free speech, but as a scientific organization, you want to assure that the people you're inviting to talk, and we have that concern every time we invite somebody for a lecture or a conference, that somebody is really an expert in the field, that they're a leading scientist. Uh, you know, we give awards at the New York Academy for uh, early career scientists, and uh, we put panels together, and we have juries, and they are very, very careful to judge the, not, you know, the nominations and applications that come in, and the science that is uh, part of each one of those applications. And they want to make decisions at the end that really reflect uh, leading science, cutting edge science in, uh, in the fields that uh, we're awarding in. Uh, and by the same token, you know, when we have a panel on uh, uh, vaccine development, we want to have the leading people in the field. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure somebody could say, you know, if you have a panel on vaccines, you're not having somebody who's coming up as an anti-vaxxer. And the truth is, you know, I don't really know of that many serious scientists who think that uh, all vaccines are nefarious, uh, that uh, taking a vaccine is a terrible idea. We know a lot of uh, very top vaccinologists who are, you know, concerned about the ways in which you do clinical trials for vaccines. They're concerned about uh, uh, pushing uh, even emergency youth use authorization for certain kinds of drug developments too quickly. Uh, because they've seen, uh, of course, the other side of, uh, of haste when it comes to approvals of, of drugs, as in the famous case, of course, of thalidomide uh, that you know, caused such dire birth effects. And you know, in the world of science, there are different views about you know, how, you, uh, how you go through the, the clinical trial process, who you put as part of your sample, how you think about you know, different uh, 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 phenotypes and the like. Uh, and, and simply how, how, how rigorous you need to be before you, 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 you put uh, uh, human lives uh, at risk, if there is any risk or to the extent to which there is risk attached to taking a particular drug, whether it's a vaccine or a therapeutic or an a, a immunological agent of one, one kind or another. So, so these, are, uh, you know, these are questions that we think about, uh, but we do think about it uh, as a scientific organization in terms, of, uh, in terms of the kind of scientific um, uh, reputation uh, that these scientists have, uh, 
And that reputation is based on what other scientists say. So yes, there is a community of scientists who make these kinds of judgments. That's what peer review is. That's why you know, Andrew Wakefield's argument, uh, article in Lancet uh, was ultimately judged to be fraudulent by his peers, by other scientists who evaluated the work and, and, and uh, were able to call it out for what it was. Um, but, you know, he looked like he might be a, a, a legitimate scientist. That's why Lancet did it. But did they publish it too quickly? Did they you know, really get adequate peer review for the, you know, all those kinds of questions are there. So you can have rigor and you can uh, use that rigor to really have the most exacting standards for who you put on a panel, who you give an award to, you know, uh, who you publish in your journals. Uh, but you're still talking about a universe that is constituted of experts uh, in, those, in those fields. What is happening today, increasingly, is that expertise itself is being called into question. And that, I think, is, um, uh, is, is, uh, is a really tricky uh, uh, problem. Uh, but again, uh, I just want to hasten to say it's not a problem that is solely about the public who is skeptical out there because you know what's happened in the last uh, 50 years or so, maybe even longer than that, is that experts began to be used increasingly in, uh, in legal trials. They began to be used uh, in, uh, in campaigns that were being put on by, for example, big tobacco or big oil to um, make a case that cigarettes are Fine, you remember the ads for, uh, or you know, uh, I, I actually do remember some of the advertisements for smoking that were, you know, doctors saying that uh, this filter was a great filter and uh, and made them feel confident that they were uh, that it was safer to smoke cool than you know than Camel or whatever, uh, and yet we know from you know from the work of uh, uh, of a number of people and some you know extraordinary investigative uh, uh, journalists who have been report who were reporting on this that these were experts who were uh, often paid a lot of money to say things that either they knew were wrong or they didn't care uh, were wrong. So what I mean to say by this is that, uh, you know, there has been, uh, a, 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 there have been a lot of cases where experts have not been terribly expert, uh, but they've been called expert. And it looks like they're basically there for hire. Uh, and when you see expertise as linked to, you know, self uh, gain and uh, and profit, it's very easy to begin to think, well, you know, everybody's in the pay of someone, and therefore, why should this expert be uh, any more reliable than that one? Yeah, exactly. Right. <clears throat> I was uh, worked on that film, Merchants of Doubt, based on Naomi Oreskes' book of the same title about not just big tobacco, but, you know, subsequent industries like the chemical industry uh, regarding flame retardant chemicals that you could put in couches and blankets and clothing and rugs and so on that arose out of the problem of uh, people uh, who smoke at home uh, falling asleep or whatever and the cigarette catches the house on fire. So rather than discouraging people from, you know, smoking in bed as you're going to bed, <laughs> Uh, you know, soak the house in chemicals that they have to buy from these companies, right? And what Naomi showed in her research is that it wasn't just the same strategies. In many cases, it was the same people that worked on right. the big tobacco. You know, doubt is our product is that famous memo that somebody uh, leaked, yeah. accidentally leaked and got out. Uh, you know, and there it's, it's kind of, what does it mean to be a skeptic? You know, I think about that since I have a magazine called Skeptic. You know, in this case, you know, it's kind of a misuse. Right, you're you. You should be skeptical of climate change. You should be skeptical of the Holocaust. You should be skeptical of whatever my pet thing is. Well, no, that's not what that means, right? So, you know, science is a, a very social process. So it's that body of experts, the people who know, and maybe there's thousands of them. <clears throat> and so when you get a consensus, like here, I'll, t I'll tell you my own journey on climate. You know, when I, I was in college in the '70s, and then just started teaching the eighties and the environmental movement was getting going. And there was all, all this talk about peak oil and we're going to run out of fossil fuels and the rainforest is going to be destroyed by the end of the eighties. All these terrible things are going to happen. Paul Ehrlich's the population bomb. It's over. It's too late. Can't feed humanity. Billions are going to die, you know, and none of this happened. Right. So by the nineties, I'm thinking, yeah, I don't know, maybe this is an area to be skeptical of, or at least 
open-minded to the possibility of being skeptical. And it wasn't really until like the mid 2000s around when Al Gore's, I heard, I heard Al speak at Ted where he gave his famous Ted talk with the, the little uh, cherry picker he had to take to get to the top of the graph of CO2 gases. And, you know, he was, he was quite the speaker. And I thought, yeah, maybe I better read some of this literature now because I haven't looked at this in a long time. And it's like, wow, there's a huge convergence of evidence, kind of a consilience of inductions, as William Ewell called it in the 19th century, that independent lines of inquiry all reaching the same conclusion. You know, conspiracy theories is something I study. You know, the idea that these scientists are all conspiring to come to this conclusion for whatever reason they they don't like free market capitalism or they hate America or or they're all in you know kind of the a, a conspiracy of grant getting and if you don't tow the proper narrative you're not going to get grants to do, study yours but in fact these scientists don't know each other they don't work in the same labs they don't even attend the same conferences you know one person studies glaciers somebody else studies the flowering of plants somebody else studies sea level rise somebody studies clouds somebody studies CO2 gases it's impossible that they're conspiring, even in some kind of subtle way, right? So the consensus leads me, somebody like me, who's an outsider, I don't study climate science, it's a pretty technical field, to be reasonably confident that it, anthropogenic global warming is probably true, uh, even though true with a small t, it's 97% consensus or whatever, you know, but to the 3%, did they, con, did, did they con, kind of converge towards some other hypothesis that's equal? No, they don't. You know, they show it's sunspot activity or it's volcanic activity or it's the cycle of the Earth's orbit and whatever. You know, they don't converge to anything, you know. So that's one way that outsiders can, you know, sort of trust science, that it's a competitive enterprise. And the other experts would debunk you if they could, because that's what they do. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, totally. I think, uh, you know, as you just put it, uh, there does develop, uh, it, it, a consensus around certain things, which uh, again doesn't mean that people know exactly what the uh, you know uh, not only the exact level of of, of warming uh, uh, over a, a, a certain period of time is uh, with absolute certainty, uh, and uh, of course predictions about the future depend uh, not only on the amount of fossil fuel that is burnt, but also on a lot of other very complex systems. And, you know, climate is one of the uh, most uh, uh, extraordinarily complex systems uh, that, you know, uh, we understand uh, is, uh, 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 is something that, you know, scientists are going to continue to study and learn about. You know, there was a time when somebody thought, well, the way to slow global warming is uh, you have uh, a volcano eruption of a particular uh, scale and, uh, uh, and coverage, and you know that's going to you know shield the sun, and it's going to cool the planet. But of course, you know, as as soon as people, scientists, be, other scientists began to look at that, they saw well, you're, there are all sorts of other unintended effects that they saw in the case of Krakatoa, and now we're beginning to really understand even today better than they did before. And you know, that's not so much a solution. It's going to have a kind of cascading of other negative effects. So, um, so I think the uh, the you know, the point here, and again, it's a very hard point to make authoritatively, is that when there is a consensus, it doesn't mean that everything is nailed down. It doesn't mean that everything is known. Uh, but it does mean that a lot of different scientists working on a lot of different things who are typically skeptical, I mean, that's how science proceeds. It's with skepticism, I mean, to use the term that you use. You, you look at somebody's uh, result and you say, well, I want to test that myself. And that's why, you know, replication is such an important thing. That's why when you can't replicate an experiment, it can actually drum somebody out of the field completely because it is, um, uh, it is, a, it is a violation of a, of a fundamental ethical norm in science that you, uh, you show what you've done, you do what you show, and you then allow others to try to do it. And if they can't do it, uh, following the, you know, the recipe that you give them, um, you, you, you have something to answer for. Uh, and, uh, and that's how consensus develops. It's not something where people just sort of sign a petition that's circulating because your friends have already signed it. It's not that. So it is, um, you know, and, you know, there's a book that somebody I know recently uh, uh, wrote um, about climate 
uh, change that is called unsettled that you may uh, have come upon. And of course, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of unsettled science. There's unsettled science in every domain. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we can also say that, you know, science sometimes proceeds through throwing out a paradigm that uh, has, has, has not been able to explain certain things and a new paradigm is brought in, as we know from the extraordinary work of Thomas Kuhn, who, uh, you know, who really wrote the book on the structure of scientific revolutions. But we also know that, um, that, that science has rules, that there's a reason that uh, we teach something called the scientific method. Uh, and that that method uh, is intended to be a publicly uh, 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 available uh, and, uh, uh, and discernible uh, 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 kind of uh, test or, or measure of any kind of, any kind of statement about a discovery or a finding uh, that you know, then is taken up by a community uh, that is skeptical uh, but with, you know, with, with more tests and more ways of looking at it and further revision and even further revision beyond that uh, uh, begins to get increasingly settled or at least certain fundamental parts of which get increasingly settled so that then the area that is unsettled sort of moves out or moves to a different place and then scientists, of course, follow that because that's often where the really interesting science is going to take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about the replication crisis that really began after Daryl Bem's famous experiment on um, sort of backward causality. So this is in, in one of our bailiwicks at, at Skeptic, you know, is psychic power possible? Is ESP, is there some kind of paranormal? Can you reverse time, you know, all this kind of weird spooky action at a distance? And, you know, we would always be asked, not just me, but skeptics in general, you know, what would it take to change your mind. I mean, what to believe in ESP or paranormal, whatever. Well, uh, publication of a rigorous experiment by a respected scientist in a lab at a university in a peer reviewed journal that's, you know, highly ranked. Okay. So Daryl Ben publishes this article. He's a highly respected social scientist, <laughs> as you know, in the journal of personality, social psychology, one of the top rated journals and at a university rigorously done and so on, and, and it's and, and he found these statistically significant results that, in this particular case, for listeners that don't know this, um, it's uh, you know subjects are sitting before a computer screen. The screen is split like you and I are split here, and on one side of the screen, an image is going to pop up, and the other side, another image will pop up. One image may be neutral, emotionally neutral. The other one's going to be kind of erotic, right? And so he found through various trial, lots of trials, lots of subjects that su uh, subjects were slightly more statistically significant, more likely to be able to anticipate before the computer even randomly generated, decided which side of the computer screen, the kind of pornographic or, uh, or erotic image would appear, they were able to anticipate this ahead of time. Just barely statistically significant. So, you know, he concludes that it's possible backward causality, right? That that they anticipate the future before it's even happened, before the computer even rolls the equivalent of the dice to decide which side of the screen, right? So Bam was on the uh, on the Colbert Report, and he called it the extraordinary pornception. And, uh, you know, I remember just thinking, what are the chances that, you know, 400 years of physics have been overturned by a social psychologist showing porn to undergraduates? I mean, come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, but, mm -hmm. but, but then the rebuttal is, yeah, but you said peer reviewed journal, prominent scientist in a lab at a university in a highly respected journal. We did that. Right. So it's not enough to have one. Right. You need yeah. to have yeah. replication, many uh, 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 experiments in other labs and so forth. Completely. And that's why, you know, and that's a it's a funny ex example, but it's uh, you know, it's all it's also one that, uh, you know, you have to answer for it, right? And, uh, and yet, as you say, it's about the community of scientists and the community operates uh, as, a, as, as a group of people who are, uh, you know, each one of them, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as you well know, uh, each one of whom is somewhat skeptical and would love to be able to, uh, you know, to, to show that yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. And they, of course, were thinking about it this week and th with the announcements of, uh, of Nobel Prizes and, uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sure you've read Walter quantum Isaacson's, entanglement. yeah, quantum entanglement, click, click chemistry, uh, 
Uh, but you know, science is uh, years later. You know, you recognize what the importance of a particular discovery is, but you also recognize that a lot of people have used it and they've tested it and they've advanced and further refined it. Uh, and it becomes, again, part of an ongoing scientific uh, body of knowledge that is always being looked at, always being uh, interrogated in, in some set of ways that, uh, you know, produces greater and greater reliability. And, uh, and, and that is uh, maybe the, not sufficient for some to believe it's absolute truth, but it's the best we have. Uh, and believe me, it's a lot better than other uh, uh, standards for, uh, for truth and for uh, the kinds of claims that, that science makes. Uh, it's, it's a pretty impressive uh, uh, thing that we've established. And I think the, the current you know, skepticism, skepticism about science is, a, is, is troubling because, uh, uh, look, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's not the case that everything that science does is good for humanity necessarily. People could uh, say right now, uh, given what's going on with uh, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and what Putin has been saying lately, that you know uh, the Manhattan Project should never have happened, that we should not have uh, come to understand, let alone uh, utilize nuclear fission as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as an object of scientific inquiry. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, scientists will pursue uh, 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 truth for all kinds of reasons, and sometimes because they are part of knowledge that is related to weapon systems, that is part of a geopolitical uh, a struggle for, uh, for dominance or for security, as the case may be. Uh, and sure, uh, you know, like all human endeavor, science takes place within the context and setting of human endeavor. But something fundamental about, uh, about, uh, about atoms were discovered and, uh, and figured out. Uh, and even there, you know, it's pretty impressive what science has done. God, you know, God protect us from, uh, uh, from, from, the, uh, uh, from the use of these weapons. But, um, but, but it's, 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 it's clear to me that, you know, while, uh, you know, look, I think that it's very important for scientists not only to do their science, but to lead the way in thinking about some of the ethical uh, uh, questions that arise from science. And I'll give uh, an example, for example, of, uh, uh, from, uh, from a case at Berkeley that I also followed very closely because it happened on my watch when I was chancellor. In 2012, Jennifer Doudna uh, published an article that showed uh, that CRISPR-Cas9 could actually edit uh, RNA. And, uh, and of course, that's led to uh, extraordinary discovery. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the story of, of CRISPR-Cas9 and, and, and RNA is told very beautifully by Walter Isaacson in his book, The Code Breaker, that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, again, uh, Isaacson, having written about uh, Einstein and uh, you know, I mean, uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful science writer as well as a biographer and uh, as, as a writer about innovation and technology. But, you know, uh, he, he tells this story of amazing scientific discovery and the kind of work that went into it and also the community of scientists who were part of it. That community was also very competitive. Uh, uh, again, there were uh, lots of efforts to publish something first, publish very quickly, to uh, even you know uh, try to fast uh, uh, fast track a scientific discovery so that you'd get credit for it, so that it would be published first. Uh, and uh, and of course, there were major patent disputes between uh, the Broad Institute at MIT and uh, and 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 my university, Berkeley, over you know who owned what part of the patent with respect to discoveries that were associated with CRISPR-Cas9. But the, the flip side of that is that, you know, when it became clear that this new scientific method was available and could have extraordinary power to intervene in the, in the human gene, uh, uh, you know, Jennifer uh, put together a working group to start developing ethical guidelines for the use, at least in humans, of CRISPR-Cas9, uh, bringing you know, top scientists from David Baltimore to many others together to try to come out with ways of thinking about the ethical implications of the use of this, of this scientific discovery. 
And of course, you know, you look back even to the development of the atom, the atom bomb. I mean, there were a lot of physicists who were very concerned about uh, its potential use and were concerned about its use in, uh, in Japan. So, you know, scientists are also, uh, uh, they're not just scientists, they're also uh, citizens of both their uh, own nations and of the world, and they're part of a community that is in fact a global community. Uh, and deeply concerned about uh, the nature of scientific discovery. So I say that because it's very easy to say, look, you know, science may be great, but look, it's, it might be obliterating us uh, uh, from the face of the earth. Uh, uh, you know, are you really going to defend science when it's threatening our very existence? Uh, and yet, of course, it's the same people often who uh, discover uh, these extraordinary things who are actually you know, at the forefront of helping us think through what the implications are and how we should live with these discoveries and perhaps in some cases regulate them, control them, uh, set, gu set guidelines uh, for the use of, et cetera. Uh, so you know, in my view, it's very important that we uh, uh, also talk about that side of the scientific uh, uh, ledger uh, because it, um, I think, uh, is critical to recapture public faith in the work that scientists do to understand, of course, that they're deeply concerned about uh, both the upsides and the possible downsides of scientific discovery. Yeah, CRISPR is a good example of uh, the survivor bias, too. We're highlighting one of the successful ones. Uh, I was studying history of science in 1989, I think it was, when the cold fusion story came out. And, you know, here it was, you know, a rush to judgment because they wanted to file those patents. This could be, uh, you know, too cheap to meter free energy for humanity. It's going to change civilization. And I remember my, one of my professors going, let's just wait and see if anybody replicates this thing. You know, I mean, yeah. it was legitimate scientists in a real lab and so on. These weren't just fringe nutballs, but, uh, and, and it failed to replicate, right? So this ended up being called bad science or, and that happens a lot also. And um, so again, people ha are maybe legitimately suspicious sometimes of scientists rushing to something like that. And that, and there's a good reason for that because you know you're just spitballing ideas, most of which are wrong. And you know, once in a while, you get one right. So we highlight that. I can't tell you how many alternative theories of physics I get, and I'm not even a physicist. You know, Einstein, Newton was wrong. Einstein was wrong. Stephen Hawking was wrong. And I've worked it all out <laughs> in my garage over the weekend. And uh, well you have to kind of know you got to be in the box to think out of the box if you don't even know what's in the box right and so there's that you know that kind of balance there between being so in the club that you can't see outside of it but you you have to know something about it so you know create you know creativity is one of these great mysteries you know how is it that einstein was able to do what no one else had done or others had come close and hinted at it but not quite right and and that happens but not not often and then I was just thinking another example of this as you were talking was you know, my latest book is on conspiracy theories. And I was thinking about Operation um, Paperclip in which the United States uh, brought over Nazi scientists that worked in various fields, chemistry, biology, and physics, the potential for nuclear weapons before the Russians would get them. Because, you know, we knew that they were going to try to nab uh, the top Nazi scientists. So we had to get it before they did, right? Werner von Braun being the most famous example of this. And But there were about 600 of these scientists, many of whom worked on chemical weapons and biological weapons that the Nazis ended up not using, but they might have. <laughs> and we put them to use, and the CIA basically uh, orchestrated this paperclip program. Uh, they put a paperclip on a file of a scientist they wanted to em employ. And in many cases, these scientists did the same things that some of the people we put up uh, uh, on trial for war crimes at Nuremberg. Uh, you know, like Werner von Braun, again, the most famous example, but, you know, he worked at Penamunde where there was a, a slave labor camp where about 30,000 Jews died of starvation and overwork. And he surely knew about this. I mean, yes, he did know about it. And, you know, later he said, well, I just was interested in space flight and this was the, you know, the only game in town here and they gave me money to do it. And, uh, you know, so the V2 rockets, well, <laughs> where they landed is not my problem, right? I just launch them. <laughs> you know, so there were some pretty questionable things there. You know, the Project MK Ultra. I don't know if you know about that. Another CIA program of mind control. Worried about the Russians, the Chinese, and the North Koreans getting an unfair advantage over us in mind control. Literally trying to create a Manchurian candidate to see if we could program somebody to assassinate a foreign leader. 
because the CIA was involved in assassinating foreign leaders. So here you read enough of this, you're like, whoa, these scientists, come on, right? I mean, this is these are real conspiracies. These really happen. Dosing American citizens with LSD uh, without their consent or even knowledge, right? Frank Olson being the famous case who apparently either jumped or was pushed out of a New York City uh, high rise to his death. And, uh, you know, that's still not resolved, right? So there's enough stories like that. Again, I'm sympathetic to people who are like, I don't know if I really trust these institutions. The CIA was doing what? You know, or the WikiLeaks, right? The NSA is doing what? You know, under President Obama, President Transparency? Wait a minute, what? (laughs) And there's enough of that that, you know, it's like, okay, I see why people are a little skeptical. Well, indeed. I, I, uh, uh, look, you know, scientists are humans and uh, uh, they're not superhumans. And uh, we know, as you just were giving some examples of, but we know that uh, the conduct of science in Nazi Germany was, uh, uh, was, 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 you know, uh, part and parcel of some of the, the worst, uh, the worst uh, violations of fundamental human rights that uh, have ever been conducted in our, in our human history. Uh, again, uh, participated in or used by scientists in one way or another. Uh, and yeah, there are uh, lots and lots of examples where uh, science has either been used or scientists have been uh, uh, out there doing things that, uh, that give a very, uh, a very bad name to, uh, to the things we call science. Uh, I think the, the uh, you know, the, again, the problem is that, you know, uh, science isn't, a transcendent activity, and scientists are themselves, you know, human beings. And at the very, uh, at the very best, of course, they're also, uh, you know, trying to establish their careers and trying to, you know, figure out um, uh, not only, you know, the science that they're learning, but you know, how to make a contribution and how to make a contribution that they, at some level and some point in their careers, can take credit for, so they can get a job or get a promotion or get an award. Get a Nobel, and yet, um, uh, yet the truth is that most scientists, and this I think you know, comes out. And I'm sure you've talked to lots and lots of scientists on this podcast. Comes out to uh, 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 when you when you talk to somebody about what is their everyday life. You know, a lot of scientists spend years on a project that ends up not working, uh, and they have to change uh, change tack, or they have to uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, try and experiment over and over again until they finally get it right. But, you know, again, it's not a glamorous life going to the bench every day and sometimes every night uh, over long periods of time when you're just basically barely moving a dial in terms of scientific knowledge. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it's not always very glamorous. Uh, it's, it's usually, uh, you know, in the words of Thomas Kuhn, it's usually normal science, uh, taking place at normal rates of, uh, of, 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 you know, normal paces and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, we can point to, uh, extraordinary things that science has accomplished. Uh, uh, and yet we should always, I think, uh, allow for, uh, uh, uh serious questioning uh, call it skepticism. Call it um, uh, call it just uh, you know a, 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 a rigorous uh, a relationship with uh, you know with any kind of uh, any kind of finding or any kind of argument uh, that is being uh, put out there. Uh, you know, in fact, things get better when you test them. Things get better when you debate them. Things tend to get better when you look at them from different points of view, different perspectives, and. Uh, and look at them over and over and over again. Uh, so, you know, at its worst, it's a human process. At its best, it's a human process. But it's uh, still pretty remarkable what, uh, what, what the community of scientists has managed to, to figure out. Now, we're at a time in our history where scientific uh, knowledge is growing perhaps faster than it has for, uh, uh, for ever, ever before. Uh, and there are now all kinds of, you know, fears and sometimes uh, uh, desires being uh, projected onto, you know, developments, for example, in artificial intelligence and natural language and GPT-3, and uh, Dolly 2, and so on. And, 
you know, some people are uh, uh, waiting for the singularity and other people are saying, you know, don't worry, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe if machines get to the level of human intelligence, they'll get to the point where they're just as confused about most things as we are. So don't worry about it. But, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of interesting time. So the, but the one thing I wanted to, to, to mention in this regard is that, uh, and you alluded to this earlier, uh, is that sometimes science proceeds not by just, you know, the endless, uh, uh, you know, hours at the bench. Sometimes it comes from some imaginative leap that some brilliant person is able to make, like Einstein. Uh, and it uh, may have all kinds of, you know, traces, all kinds of causes, all kinds of antecedents. But it also comes from a certain level of, of just plain old uh, uh, genius uh, and, and insight. And, um, and, and it does come from knowing a lot about what's in the box, but then thinking outside of the box or able to look outside the box in order to broaden the very basis of that box. And at that point and in that level, uh, you have to wonder sometimes, do we always support science in the sense that you can do something completely different? Because it is true that scientists have to uh, put proposals together for funding. They tend to put a proposal together based on what they've done before, based on how they've been successful before. Uh, but what about, you know, what about the scientist who wants to try something completely different, completely new? Do we have uh, adequate systems for uh, supporting that and on occasion, you know, providing uh, adequate funding for something that may not either be uh, a directly uh, uh, seeable, you know, future scientific uh, finding on the one side or something commercializable and part of the kind of innovation economy on the other. And that's where I, you know, I do have to say, I think we need a multiple uh, of different ways to support science and to support science sometimes that... Um, is outside the box, but typically, as you said, uh, you can only go outside the box once you've really uh, gotten control over what's inside that very box. Mm -hmm. All right, Nicholas, we've been going right up on uh, 90 minutes, which seems to be my natural length, but I don't want to let you go before you answer this question for me, because I get it all the time, and I, I'm, I don't know what the right answer is myself. How do you talk to somebody who's a climate skeptic or a vaccine hesitant or they don't believe evolution or whatever? You're at the you're at the family uh, Thanksgiving dinner coming up here next month and somebody blurts out, you know, oh, that Anthony Fauci, they just, he just wants to control the American population or, you know, they hate America or, you know, it's a fascist thing or a communist, whatever, or whatever the thing is. You know, how do you, what do you say? <laughs> I mean, you could be polite and not say anything, but if you're going to say something, how do you talk to somebody like that? Well, it's, uh, that's a really difficult question. And, uh, you know, aside from saying pass the turkey, uh, you know, one uh, <laughs> right. uh, does need to think about, you know, how you address uh, somebody who uh, will just start out by saying they just don't believe it. <clears throat> now, you know, for somebody who's lived, as I have, my entire life in the university, uh, it requires a Thanksgiving dinner with my extended family, not my immediate family, but my extended family, to get to the point where I might have that conversation be something uh, more than hypothetical. Uh, and, um, uh, and you know what I've learned, and again, it's not my default, because my default is to give numbers and statistics and facts and, you know, really uh, try to demonstrate that uh, you know what you're talking about and therefore somebody else should accept that you know what you're talking about. I try to tell some stories. And I try to come up with stories that, you know, do, in fact, uh, um, bridge uh, uh, some of the kinds of uh, skeptical assumptions, perhaps, that, you know, somebody who would take a position like that, whether it's anti-vax or climate skeptic or what have you, uh, and, and tries to find some common ground. And, you know, we have common ground across even the most uh, extreme political divides. I know we do because... Again, I have, uh, I have family and, uh, uh, and live in uh, central Iowa, some of whom have very different views and, and, and are very deeply uh, uh, skeptical about uh, you know, a whole variety of things that go along with <clears throat> what I take for granted as, uh, as expertise. Uh, but we also share a lot, and not just you know, kinship in a, 
in, a, in an extended way. Uh, and we care about uh, we care about outcomes, and we we care about uh, in fact you know making the world a better place. Uh, and I, I I I can't give an example of something that will necessarily work uh, uh, for any given uh, example you might come up with, but I can say that uh, we do need as scientists or journalists who write about science or, uh, or others who are dependent on the world of science for what they do, whether it's working in you know, entrepreneurship or anything else. We do have to be a lot more tolerant of different ways of knowing, different ways of thinking, uh, and accepting that, uh, that sometimes it's not going to be the statistic or the fact that is going to persuade somebody, and maybe not anything, maybe not anything that will persuade someone but that there are ways to, 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 to talk that can bring people at least a little closer together. Uh, and so, you know, when I talk to people about science communication, I say, you have to use a lot of different languages uh, because people speak a lot of different languages. And we have to, uh, we have to be much better at, um, at translation uh, and indeed changing both the the, the, the words we use, but also the kind of rhetoric, the kind of pitch that we might adopt uh, when it comes to trying to persuade somebody. Sometimes just accepting that a story can be told that could be shared as a, uh, as a, as a compelling narrative about some part of our lives or some part of our world is enough to at least begin to build that bridge. Perfect. Perfectly stated, Nicholas, a great place to end it.